Hello from Seattle, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, uh, this is Colin O'Keefe with Lexblog. I'm joined by Michelle Newbaum. We'll get started in uh, just a second. We'll give people a few seconds to join. Um, but thanks, everybody, for, for taking the time. I see we got people filtering in right now. Uh, excited to have everybody join us. And uh, we'll get started here in... Again, give us just a few as we allow a few more people just to filter in here and then we'll get started uh, right away. So we'll get started in about a minute or two. And then uh, if you're not, if you're in here, of course, you can ask us questions, anything like that. Uh, we're also streaming this and then we'll have the recording afterwards as well in case you have a, a commitment you have to bounce out of as well. All right, let's get rolling. Uh, welcome everybody to our first Lexblog webinar in a little bit. My name is Colin O'Keefe. I am publisher here at Lexblog. Uh, um, I oversee the network, all the content that is being produced, uh, constantly keeping an eye on what's flowing across our network, uh, and also do a lot of these types of sessions for uh, individual law firms, for lawyers, for marketing groups, and stuff like that as well. Uh, I'm here in Seattle, Washington, a beautiful day here in the Ballard neighborhood of Seattle, Washington, and I'm joined by Michelle Newbaum. She is in Nice, France. <laughs> Michelle, how's Nice today? Yeah, it's good. I'm joining you over here in my evening. <laughs> but yeah, I'm Michelle Newblom. I'm the editor at Lexblog. So I oversee like the curation of the front page. I see all the content that flows in and out of our network, help out with blogging strategy, all good things like that. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, and we're excited to talk with you all here today. This should only be about 30, 35, maybe 40 minutes. We'll give time for questions. Uh, Alec Downing, our excellent uh, editorial intern is your publishing intern is joining us. He's producing this webinar, keeping an eye on the questions, making sure that everything flows right. Uh, so go ahead and, you know, drop questions in as we go. We can answer them as we go. We'll keep an eye on those types of things. Um, but yeah, we'll get off and rolling. And here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, or actually a little bit of housekeeping before we uh, dive into what we're going to cover today. First of all, there's more of these to come. We're going to try to do these on a monthly basis. So stay tuned. We'll have another one coming uh, in December that you'll be able to tune into. Um, on that point, a couple of resources that you may not be aware of. Some of you may be aware of. Uh, 99 Park Row is the new blog from the Lexblog team where we weigh in on all things digital publishing, uh, what we're working on at Lexblog. So if you want a little behind the scenes on hey, you know, here's what our, our, our tech team has done to make your blog a little bit faster, a little bit more secure. Or uh, I know uh, we're working on, hey, here's some upgrades that we're looking at to our publishing platform and stuff like that as well. Uh, second, we have the lexblog.com resource center, uh, which just has a number of articles that are more how-tos, really strategy-centric, has post ideas and stuff like that. If you go to just lexblog.com, 
in the top right, you'll see a link to the resource center. Uh, and finally, uh, our podcast, some of you may have even been on this podcast. Uh, this week in legal blogging, we talked to some of the best law bloggers around, people who are in the blogging space. You'll hear clips from this show uh, throughout this presentation as we grab some real world examples of people who have seen success with business develop or business development success with blogging, excuse me. Um, if you're a Lexblog client and you want something like this just for your lawyers or for your team, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, that's what we do. I did. I was just talking with somebody yesterday on a session like this. Uh, I did one of these last week for a large law firm. So if there's something that you want us to hit and you're a Lexblog client, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach me directly, Colin, C-O-L-I-N at Lexblog.com. And I'd be happy to put something together for you uh, and get that done. And then similarly, you know, if you like these webinars, if you like this one afterwards, you're like, hey, I wish they would do something on blank, post ideas, something like that. Uh, reach out to that on, a, reach out to us on that and let us know as well. Um, but perfect. Without further ado, we're going to, you know, dive into, uh, it's a really fundamental issue, but a lot of people lose sight of what success looks like as a law blogger, what business development success actually looks like, like what, what, you know, how, what does it sound like? What does it look like? Um, as opposed to some of the questions that we hear really frequently, um, which is to say you want to be asking the right questions and focusing on the right things. Uh, our support team, who I know if you are, are tuned into this webinar, keeping an eye on things, have probably heard a lot of these things. How do we get more traffic? You know, this number is not the number that I want to see. I want to see, a, you know, a bigger number. I want to see a bigger number than last time. You know, how do we rank higher and search for, for, for privacy law or privacy lawyer? How do we add email subscribers? You know, we want to see our email subscriber list grow. Um, that isn't to say that these things don't matter or anything like that, but you don't want them to be the primary focus because I, I've been doing this for a long time, uh, probably closing in on about 12 years with Lexblog. Uh, what we really don't ever hear uh, bluntly is, hey, you know, we ranked really, you know, we're one of the largest law firms in the world and we ranked really high for privacy lawyers. So we get hired for, you know, complex multi-million dollar data breaches all the time. You know, that's just how we get hired is ranking high for privacy layer. It's just not necessarily how that works in sophisticated practice areas. Um, or similarly, wow, we get, you know, so much web traffic. It's insane. And we can see that when the web traffic spikes, we get more work. It's not quite how it works. And again, that isn't to say that these things don't matter. We want to focus on the same things. And then similarly, you know, we've never necessarily heard, oh my gosh, you know, our email opens are through the roof. That's directly where we get our work. Are these things reflections of doing things right? Yes, but you want to ask the right questions first and not work against these objectives purely. Uh, so on that, you really, a lot of what I talk about in blogging strategy and will in this presentation is it's going to feel a little like common sense. And that's really what you should focus on is not overthinking it. Uh, keep in mind how people traditionally hire lawyers. Uh, it's on their reputation. It's on asking other people who they trust. It's on who they individually trust as they go on. It's not, wow, I have an insanely complex business dispute I'm going to Google business dispute lawyer and then call the first person. Uh, it's not really how it works. Uh, and your goal in authoring these blogs is, you know, you want to aim high. We'll get into some examples of what it looks like when you succeed. And it's, these are people that have seen real world success that have seen, uh, you know, they've, they've reached kind of the pinnacle. The ceiling is high on these types of things. And your goal should be, to the go-to resource or one of the go-to resources on blank, on a subject. So set that as a goal and then also consider, all right, is this subject an area where I can be the go-to resource on blank? Uh, this is what I alluded to on the last slide, but while the metrics usually reflect the goal, like if you're writing good content, you're forming good relationships, will your traffic go up over time if you're producing great content and doing the right things? Yeah, absolutely but they aren't the goal unto themselves. Your goal is not to write a blog that trends upward in traffic. Your goal is to bring in work and also enhance your reputation and build relationships with folks. So that's why it's important to celebrate the right wins. Uh, I know some people on 
uh, this webinar are likely marketing professionals at large law firms. Uh, I've been in the position of working in digital marketing and having to report on that. Uh, and you're in the position where you kind of feel like you have to, uh, if not justify your job, justify the efforts that you're conducting. And sometimes it's very easy to say, hey, this arrow is pointing up, therefore I'm doing a good job, which isn't necessarily wrong. But at the same time, there can be some really fun anecdotal wins as well, such as, hey, our lawyer wrote this post and then they emailed it to so-and-so and now he's connected with this GC that we weren't otherwise connected with. Hey, they got a speaking engagement they wouldn't have otherwise gotten and it went really, really well. Uh, hey, we did get, you know, while we, you know, you're not worried about adding, you know, oh, we added 60 email subscribers, sounds good, but also sounds good as, hey, uh, you know, by the way, we just added the, the, you know, the chair of the CFPB to our email subscribers. So celebrate those individual wins and highlight those as you go, because that's really what you're focusing on. Uh, Michelle, anything else that I'm missing? I think you pretty much hit everything there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and really, like, like I said, I'll say these in a lot of presentations, but I just can't emphasize the part that's don't overthink it too much. Uh, as you get into these metrics, engagement rates, opens, and all this type of stuff, uh, what you're really looking for is, yeah, that evidence. And it's like, all right, well, don't overthink it too much. Uh, and we'll get into some examples here. Um, perfect. So let's dive in. This publication, uh, we're going to go through three examples from three different kind of setups and firms. We'll start with what is, I don't know if it's typical for, for the people who operate on Lexblog, but it is a large percentage of people who operate on Lexblog, which are blogs from large law firms operating in niches, their group blogs and stuff of that ilk. This is one of my very, very, very favorites in this space. It would be, you'd be hard pressed to find a blog that has been more successful than Ballard Spar's Consumer Finance Law Monitor, I guess just Consumer Finance Monitor. Uh, Ballard Spar is a top 100 firm. They started this in July of 2011. Uh, it was led by then practice group leader, Alan Kaplinski, and it started as the CFPB monitor, which is a really key point here. Uh, one of the things that they really nailed is they launched this blog and plan to launch this blog with the start of the CFPB. Uh, the CFPB was a new governmental agency uh, under a democratic administration. It was geared up to do some serious regulatory work to make some very serious rulemaking. And Ballard Spar identified that and said, hey, we're gonna be all over this. Alan Kaplinski, uh, who we'll hear from in a second, uh, was instrumental in making sure that, hey, we're going to get this thing off the ground and make sure that this works exactly right. Actually, let me make sure I'm going to about to share my audio exactly right. So give me two secs, share screen, there, share sound, there we go. And we're back. And now we'll hear from Alan now that we got that exactly right. It succeeded on every score. One, uh, it's brought in new business from existing clients. It, by connecting those dots, the client will call up one of the lawyers and say, hey, we got a problem here? And they very well might. It has brought in new clients that uh, didn't know about us before. It has um, raised our, I guess you could say, our brand nationally uh, because everybody you know, knows about our blog and uh, people talk about it all the time. Uh, it's helped us recruit. You know, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, there are particularly mm -hmm. more senior people who are coming from another law firm where they don't have a blog or podcast. Uh, they're looking for ways to develop business. And if you want a national practice, you can't count on going out to play golf, uh, you know, uh, with the, uh, uh, the local banker uh, that used to work when I first began practicing law right. uh, and, and I was never a good golfer. So, you know, that, that didn't work for me, but uh, electronic media sort of levels the playing field and enables those lawyers that maybe you aren't good golfers, but know an area of law uh, can write about it and then talk about it during a podcast, uh, it really gives you a heads up. Uh, uh, it really helps a great deal. 
So some notes on that. I'll, I'll be blunt. I like both things, but I will admit golfing is more enjoyable than blogging. I like that too. But uh, as Alan alludes to, uh, blogging is probably a little bit better for business development these days. And it's important to keep in mind what do you lose to there and the benefits there and how work comes as a result. Uh, one of the ones that we hear about frequently is, hey, I've been reading you for a long time. You know, I've been keeping an eye on what you're putting out there. And hey, you identified it could be in their case some, you know, a new development from the CFPB. And then I'm going to reach out and say, oh, hey, you know, Alan, do we got a problem here? Um, and, and walk through that. Uh, and again, they've established themselves as having really the go to publication on the CFPB and in consumer finance. They aimed that high. Uh, there's no substitute for being that go to resource for accomplishing that. Uh, one of my favorite stories from Alan is. Uh, I talked to him several years ago and he was saying how the first time he met then director of the CFPB, Richard Cordray, uh, I think he was the first director of the CFPB. Uh, he, I, don't, I, I can't remember the context under which he met Cordray, but he you know, walks up to him and goes, hey, Richard, you know, it's nice to finally get the chance to, to meet you. And, and, and the CFPB director, this guy who leads this agency says back, you know, I, I know we've never met before, but you know, I, I hear your name about every single day because of your blog. Uh, and that's how successful they are. Uh, and what they did right is they seized the opportunity. Uh, they saw the, the CFPB was going to launch and they were ready with a blog to cover it. Uh, and they didn't set out to cover just general consumer finance. They said, we're going to own the CFPB. Similarly, when Trump was elected and then there was bound to be less regulation on this front, they, they shifted it to be less CFPB centric, but it was still crucial that they went niche on that front. Uh, one little thing that they have, and Alan called it a secret weapon on the podcast, is they have a lawyer. You can see her name there, Barbara Michigan. Uh, she went to Alan and said, hey, you know, I, I don't need to be doing some of the stuff, you know, that I'm doing on, on the traditional lawyer stuff. What I'd really like to do is just write and write a ton. So it may see, and, and that's most of what she does as a lawyer at Ballard Spar is write for this publication. And they may, that may not be reasonable for every single firm to have a lawyer who dedicates so much time to writing. But if you're at one of these large law firms and you're competing in these spaces, again, it may not be realistic for everyone, but you know, bluntly, Ballard Spar is doing that and it is working. And again, it's not right for everybody, but it is something someone is doing. Uh, Ballard Spar also does a really good job in taking it beyond the blog. They have podcasts, webinars, and things of that ilk that really revolve around what they have going on there. And one feeds off the other. One of the things that I frequently say is people will take something as seriously as you take it yourself. So if you're constantly pushing people to a blog and you're constantly on your webinars and podcasts and saying, hey, the home base for everything we're doing in consumer finance is this blog, people will come to understand, all right, this is serious. They're putting a lot of effort into it and follow along accordingly. Uh, and lastly, there's no substitute for having a champion lawyer to having somebody like Alan who says, we're going to do this and we're going to do it well. Uh, as background, Alan is one of the leading attorneys in this space. And without casting an opinion on these things, this is, this is somebody who invented basically class action waivers, one of the biggest, um, uh, consumer legal issues of the past decade or so. Uh, so he is doing some serious, heavy duty work, but he knows, hey, I want to run this publication and I want to run it well. Uh, and there's no substitute for having that group leader, for having somebody say, we're going to do this, we're going to do it well, we're going to seize this opportunity and we're going to go after it. Um, and it's worked exceptionally, exceptionally well. Again, if I could close it out on this example, you'd be hard pressed to find uh, a large law blog that does a better job and has been more successful than uh, the Consumer Finance Monitor previously, uh, the CFPB Monitor. Uh, and with that, we'll go on to our uh, next example, which is one of my favorites. And I, I'll tee up Michelle to take that one. Yeah, so I think for me personally, one of my favorite blogging success stories has to be Hillary Brickens. It's just such a unique one and honestly, a really good example of taking advantage of a niche and growing to own it. Um, you could even consider her to be like the cannabis lawyer nowadays. And she also started the ever popular and reputable Canna Law blog. 
And it didn't take some huge law firm to propel her to success, which I think is what's really inspirational. So just as some background for those of you that don't necessarily know the ins and outs of Hillary Bricken's story, uh, when she first became a lawyer and joined what was then Harris Moore in 2010, she was by no means entering the field of law looking to practice in cannabis. Um, the firm she joined already felt comfortable looking into more obscure up and coming industries. And Dan Harris, another big blogging name, he runs the China Law Blog. He approached her as a fresh associate and told her she should really look into practicing cannabis. And this was in Washington, a state that did have law pertaining to medical marijuana since 1998, I think. But it was obviously very much a new sector, especially when it came to the more recreational and business purpose use. So a year after she took over that area, uh, they were experiencing a lot of success, a lot of clientele growth, and they decided to launch the Canna Law Blog. And so they looked to the China Law Blog as their blueprint. So nowadays, it's a leading publication that many look to in order to stay informed about the cannabis industry. Uh, when Hillary first began the blog, she started as their first and only author, but it has now expanded to become a well-organized, multi-authored publication. But I think a really big question too is how do you know when you're looked to as an authority? Like when do you know when you've necessarily achieved that status where people look to you as a thought leader in your area? Uh, and Hillary was also a guest on our podcast this week in legal blogging, and she recounted this really cool experience where a huge player in the industry recommended her blog to a room full of people. So we'll hear that firsthand from her. I think the very first time where I saw some distinct ROI was when I was at a public speaking engagement in Spokane, Washington, of all places. I was on stage with at least one major, major decision maker and influencer and regulator on what was then the Liquor Control Board. It's now the Liquor and Cannabis Board. And he was kind enough, and this was unprompted by me, completely unsolicited, to tell the crowd to check out one of the blog articles I had written about the top 10 red flags in the cannabis industry. This is like 2014. And I thought, wow, if a government, you know, government guy who you know has no ties to our firm there's no kind of relationship here is willing to put that out there as a beacon of information we are doing something incredibly right and then the most recent development was that um, we've showed up in a couple of law school textbooks citing to our articles which is just incredibly bizarre and I know these things become obsolete incredibly quickly but that was pretty cool so from then until now that's been the progression um, really literally from public service announcements to academia uh, those were the indicators where I knew you know, this this is more than just legal writing to try to drum up work. This is actually important, and we're seen as an authority in the space. And honestly, now we kind of have the obligation to write on some of these things as a leader, and and that's really where you want to be. So okay. yeah, so as you heard firsthand, um, blogging can indeed build that reputation for you. Uh, when you are putting in the time, the effort, and just taking all the steps you can to do it right. So um, what I think has contributed to the blog's profound success is a mixture of a few key ingredients. Uh, first off, it does a really great job speaking to lay people in a way that's digestible, something that every good blog kind of has to model when your audience isn't other lawyers. You know, it needs to be understandable to a general public and look appealing, not necessarily riddled with endnotes or case citations or overwhelming chunks of text. And, you know, Hillary really took the opportunity that Dan Harris presented her with and ran with it. Uh, she put in the work when the blog was in its infancy. She was the only one handling it and she grew it to what it is now, uh, rather than, you know, dismissing this rather niche industry and practicing in it just for the sake of doing job she really sees the opportunity she was given and I also think it's really impressive the scope that the publication has taken on uh, it covers an entire industry and then it will apply you know different practice areas to it cannabis law can pertain to compliance advertisement IP issues and I mean their blog just tackles pretty much every area that they think is going to be important to their readers 
their blog posts don't just read as these kind of like news pieces, but they always provide some sort of legal analysis as a way to give their audience something unique and of value, something to keep them coming back to this specific publication for more. And uh, Hillary has also mentioned on her podcast before that their team really pays attention to the ongoing trends and they'll write on things that they think are going to be of utmost importance while also being intriguing. So, you know, on that note, they write about interesting stuff. If you want people to read your blog, you got to write stuff that they're going to want to read. So they execute this really well by not just strictly sticking to serious topics, but they'll go outside of the box and come up with things on their own that they think are going to be entertaining rather than just waiting for the latest piece of legislation to come down the pipeline. And so the compilation of all of these things has really resulted in Hillary and the blog uh, to be this authority in the space. And even reporters and journalists will look to her in the publication alongside the other noteworthy figures, you know, she mentioned in that audio clip. Because when you're working in a niche, you have the ability to be the person that people turn to when they need information. I mean, those working in media aren't always going to have like a deep, thorough background on the topics they're writing about. So they'll oftentimes need to look to that voice of authority. And you can be that voice of authority through blogging. So just in terms of Hillary Bricken and Canna Log Blog, I think just like to end it off, you know, you have to have fun with it. You have to write about the things you enjoy if you're going to stick with it long term and, you know, try to replicate or find the similar type of success that Hillary, the firm and the blog all did. Yeah, that and that's a great she just did so many things. Well, uh, and, you know, similar to what we mentioned with Valor's Bar and what you alluded to there is she just, you know, sees the opportunity. We still have people launching cannabis law blogs as you know makes sense but <clears throat> timing is also of the utmost importance i mean they jumped on this before almost anybody i mean we in the last few years still had large law firms that would kind of launch them and then they go oh can we hide this for a little bit because we have somebody else joining us and we're not really sure if we should be in this space and here you have harris moore yeah it's on the candle law blog and they're writing about trademarking psychedelics already so it's like it's one of those things where I, you know, you understand why there's some level of hesitation and you understand why you don't want to be the first person to jump, but at the same time, somebody's going to be. So, I mean, if you're thinking about starting a cannabis blog, blog, sure you can, but should it be the cannabis labor blog? Should it be the cannabis IP blog? Uh, should it be cannabis employment? Should it be, you know, something exclusively on edibles or concentrates or what have you, or online reviews or something um, so we'll get into a little bit more of that in a second, but, uh, keep that in mind to, to really go after those specific opportunities, as opposed to here's a subject, we're just going to launch it. Cause it's what we do. Mm-hmm. Speaking uh, of focus, this is one of my very favorites and somebody who does a great job of expanding beyond their niche, but also launching a publication that's on a specific issue. Uh, we touched on Ballard Spar, really large law firm, uh, that launches a group blog, uh, now Harris Brick and she's a named partner at the firm is great. It's still so crazy that that happened, uh, was kind of a solo blog evolved into a team blog with a smaller firm. And now what we have here is FML insights. It's by Jeff Nowak of Littler. He was previously with more of a mid-sized firm then made the jump to Littler. So a little bit different setup, but single author blog, uh, focuses, of course, on the Family and Medical Leave Act. It started way back in 2009, uh, and he really hones in on, on leave, of course, but also touches on some employment law as well. And similar to what you described uh, or what we heard from Hillary as far as what business development success looks like for her, it was, wow, it's pretty nice when a regulator says she knows what she's talking about to a, you know, a crowd of people who could potentially hire you. Uh, here's what it sounds like. Uh, for Jeff and kind of how it plays out. It was about three years into the blog, but there came a point about three years in where um, I was retained by a a national airline, um, one of the national airlines. And it was um, incredible at that point for me to realize that they didn't hire me because I had a blog. They, um, but they had followed me for quite some time and they learned to uh, that, that, that they had in someone in, in me, someone that they could trust, someone who, who knew what he was talking about in the area, or at least BSing his way through it enough for them to appreciate uh, that. But, but that there was a, they found someone that was, that, that they could trust. 
and they they wanted to give me a, a shot at helping them through some of the the leave issues that they were dealing with at the time. Um, so it became clear to me at that point, I guess that was a moment for me. It became clear for me at that point that um, I was connecting with people uh, in a way that, that they found trustworthy enough to, to start uh, sending their questions my way. And we got a common theme here. I know it's something that everybody on this webinar has probably heard a million times, started with a niche, but uh, you know, it sounds straightforward and it's like, oh yeah, duh, of course I'll do that. I can't tell you how many times we get on a, a strategy consultation or a support call, or even maybe having in the sales process where somebody goes, yeah, I know, I, you know, I know or something like, Hey, yeah, I know the FMLA is good, but I really do more than FMLA work. I don't want to write just about the FMLA. Jeff doesn't just write about the FMLA and he doesn't just do FMLA work. But let me tell you, when you have, you know, digitally written the book on the FMLA, you pick up a lot of employment work and I can imagine including as he alludes to uh, work for a national airline. Um, so again, you're not limiting yourself. You're really targeting an opportunity where you think I can be a lead voice here. I can make a name for myself on this subject. You know, if you start a niche blog, that isn't to say that this is all you're ever going to do for the rest of your life. It doesn't even mean uh, this is the only thing that you're going to write on. Uh, Jeff writes on a lot of employment issues, a lot of leave issues that aren't exclusively related to FMLA. Uh, but still, when you brand yourself as that and you add that focus, uh, it's a real difference maker. He could have very easily started I don't know, the, the Illinois employment law blog. And that isn't to say that those things shouldn't be around, but, you know, you know, Jeff writes on things nationally. He works on probably all areas of employment law and he could have easily done the employment law blog and been one of hundreds, if not thousands of those, but he stayed focused and didn't lose sight of the fact that, yeah, does he do other work? Does he write on other things? Absolutely. Uh, Jeff is probably as good as anybody at making his posts extremely accessible. You will not see footnotes, case citations, stuff like that. His posts are highly scannable. I know that's something we talk about a lot, uh, but the reason for that is the first decision that people make when they open up a blog post or any piece of online content is not whether it's good or not, it's whether they're gonna read it or not. If they open it and they see, hey, this is big chunks of text, we got case citations all over the place, uh, I'm probably just going to go find something that's a little bit more readable and it might be from somebody like Jeff. Um, he has a lot of personality in that regard. One of my favorite things that he does though, is he does a great job of answering questions. And what I mean by that is his posts oftentimes will revolve around questions. And if not the entire post sections of the post will have headers that answer specific questions on issues. And that's really helpful because honestly, a lot of times that's how people search when they search the web. And similarly, it's really a great thing to have in your back pocket when you're communicating with clients and potential clients. So if a client reaches out and has a specific question, you can send them that blog post. Or similarly, if a client reaches out with a question that a bunch of other people are probably going to have, you can turn that into a blog post. Uh, and oftentimes, I mean, honestly, the thing that I say a lot is blog posts are probably closer to emails than, than, than legal reviews type writing. Uh, when it comes to writing style and stuff like that, you're really just communicating person to person the way you communicate in a conversational tone. Uh, so he does a really, really, really good job. If you're looking for, hey, how should I format my blog posts? What should they look like? What's the writing style? Regardless of practice area, uh, FMLA Insights is an excellent example. Really all the blogs we've highlighted today, but especially uh, FMLA insights, especially in the you know the employment law space, but this applies to almost every other. And then, as I alluded to, he owns his subject. He owns the FMLA. He owns employment leave issues, but he isn't limited to it. Uh, he you know he he hits on all the big things in employment law. Uh, so that isn't to say that you can't start a niche publication and own that space and feel like, oh gosh, I'm not going to have enough to write about, or I don't want to only write about that. You don't have to. Nobody's going to make you. You know, Lexblog's not going to shut off your blog if you stray from your niche or anything like that. Uh, it's not going to happen. But it's a great, great, great place to start. Um, and with that, those are our three examples. And I want to get to kind of our takeaways so you have that. Um, the ceiling on, and then the biggest things that I can take away from these 
are, and Michelle, I'll open up to you right after this as well, is the ceiling is high. Uh, if you want to be the go-to lawyer on a subject, uh, you can do that. You just have to identify the right subject and work at it. Um, so aim high. It isn't so much as, hey, you know, we'd like to rank a little higher here and get a little bit more traffic to our website for this. You can play that game if you want to, but it's it's more fun to be like, I want to be the leading lawyer in the country on blank. I want to be the person who's known all over the place for doing exceptional work in blank. I want to be the first person the media call on, you know, whatever. Um, and again, it's cliche as can be, but you do need a niche. One of the things that very frequently happens is people will say, oh, well, I mean, we got this practice group and we're trying to grow it a little bit. So we should start a blog that's just in the same subject as the practice area. You can, you can do that for sure. A lot of people do. Most firms do. But think, think beyond that. Think about, hey, what are the things that we need to be writing about right now that, that we're working on where we're trying to get more work beyond just the practice areas? Is it a transit law blog? Is it, I'm, I'm thinking of the things that I'm passionate about. Is it an e-bike law blog? Is it, uh, like I mentioned before, don't just start a cannabis law blog. Is it a cannabis employment law blog? And again, that isn't to say you're going to only do this work or the firm's going to only be known for that. Ballard Spar did other consumer finance work outside the realm of the CFPB, but they said, hey, we're going to cover this because we think we can provide a great resource on this subject. Uh, as tough as it is, there's no substitute for consistency. There's no substitute for, for consistently putting out posts. Ballard Spar, boy, if, you know, if you're a large law firm competing in the consumer finance space and you're trying to put out as much content as them, Good luck. Um, but honestly, it's one of those things where it's tough to do. It's not easy to do, but you know, you allocate the resources and, it, and it's in some spaces, it's what your competitors are doing. Uh, and last but not least, uh, remember it is a blog. Um, it's not illegal or it's not writing. It's not this, it's not that it's not something where you have to constantly be writing up your own treatises and stuff like that. It's a blog. Uh, write in a conversational tone. It can be as simple as here's this interesting thing I saw. Here's a quote from that interesting thing. And here's why I thought it was interesting. And also it's a great vehicle for building relationships. As you go, all of the people that we talked about here have done an exceptional job building relationships, both uh, deliberately and also as a result of producing great content. You have the Canalaw blog with the, the regulator at the, the, the Liquor and Cannabis Board. Uh, you have uh, Alan Kaplinsky and the CFPB director. And then, of course, you have uh, uh, Jeff Novak with eventually, you know, people who are hiring him at a major layer line. So it's a great opportunity to be able to network. Uh, Michelle, anything uh, that I missed or anything on that front? Yeah, I would just say one more thing to emphasize is I think we get asked a lot, like, how frequently should you post? And I think it is important to remember that, like, I would say at least consistency is more important than frequency, um, especially like depending on the size of your blog, the size of your firm. For a lot of people, they post once a day if they have a lot of writers, a lot of people once a week, some even once a month. And I think it's just whatever schedule you stick to, just make sure it's something that's manageable and something you can keep up with. Because I mean, like it might sound silly, but imagine like if your favorite TV show or podcast didn't have a reliable schedule, like you wouldn't tune into it as much because you wouldn't know when to expect content. So just whenever you're deciding like frequency, consistency, I think I would just make sure that it's manageable and try to really follow that schedule from the get go, because then it's going to become a habit. It will be ingrained in your schedule. And yeah, that was just the only thing I would add on. Yeah, get those wins. I mean, honestly, that's the big thing is everybody has their own like we have one of my favorites is uh peter Mahler, new york business divorce blog kevin lacroix has honestly the exact same schedule he's at the dno dno diary or dno diary. discord i can't remember the exact idea but they have a post every monday morning that's just what they do they write it on sunday it goes out monday morning that is that's not going to work for everybody some people have you know might want to just chill and watch football all day sunday and they like sunday night football and they're on these coasts and it goes really late and that's not when they want to do it uh, for other people, it might be, hey, my Wednesday media, you know, I, Wednesdays are great for me. I've blocked off some time and I'm write one post then. Or it could be, hey, I want to make sure when I get started, I'm putting out two posts a month. Um, like I mentioned off the top, the most important thing, just go easy on yourself. Don't make this as hard as it seems. Um, bluntly, one of the things that happened, you know, with my blog recently, and I got to get going more is 
for a long time, I meant to write a long blog post about my observations from having an e-bike for 5,000 miles, basically. And it all came from my own head. I had to write it all from my own head, which made it much more overwhelming versus just, hey, here's this interesting thing. Here's a trend. I'm commenting on what's going on around me versus I'm just going to write whatever comes to my head and it's going to all be completely from me. It's much more difficult and it can really uh, jam up your workflow and your rhythm if you're kind of get, you know, hit a post that's like really hard to write out. Uh, and that can jam up your whole team as a result. But to Michelle's point, yeah, find the consistency uh, versus the frequency. You don't want to write four days in a row and then go three months without a post uh, or something like that, because it's just, it's hard to develop that trust over time. And the way that that comes in, sorry to keep going on this point is we talked about uh, uh, Jeff Nowak, for example, um, how they said, hey, you know, they had followed the blog for a while you can't have people follow a blog for a while if you're not consistently putting out content, if you don't have a rhythm to what you're doing, because eventually you'll just get tuned out and people won't come back. They won't subscribe. They won't, you know, they just don't come to expect things from you. Um, but if you're constantly putting things out or consistently, I should say, putting things out, people go, okay, you know, I know I develop a relationship over time and then, oh, wow. You know, we've kind of got this hairy leave thing going on. I better call Jeff. You know, he's actually written about a lot of this stuff. I'm going to ask him really quick and see what's going on. Um, but with that, I open it up. If people have questions, uh, hit us with anything that you've got. Uh, one of the questions that came in is, uh, will the slides be available? Maybe the replay? Uh, yes to both. Uh, we'll make sure that the slides go up on uh, 99park row, our blog, 99parkroad.com. Uh, we'll also have the recording there. And because this went out live on all our socials, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and LinkedIn. Honestly, as soon as this is done, even literally now, you can go watch the entire thing and take a look at it there. But we will also have it on 99 Park Row as well. Uh, but with that, open it up. Don't have to, but don't hesitate. If you have any questions, drop them in the chat. And um, we're happy to answer them. Uh, and then again, at the same time, uh, if you would like, you know, if you're a Lexblog client and you want us to put together something like this for your firm that takes a look at you know, some of the content that's out there, or if you want to say, Hey, I'd love to have you give this directly to our lawyers directly in the privacy space. We can put something together like that as well. We're always happy to do that type of thing. Um, haven't gotten any questions thus far. I'll give it another minute or so. Like I mentioned, uh, we'll have another webinar next month. Look for the date on that on 99parkrow.com. Uh, be sure to subscribe to our podcast. Michelle's running that. Uh, this week in legal blogging, you can get it wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, iTunes, or I guess it's Apple Podcasts now, uh, TuneIn, Stitcher, the like, uh, we're all over there and you can hear from people. And if you know, you've got a lawyer at your firm that's been immensely successful and you'd like to share their story, uh, hit us up on that as well. Uh, we'd love to have them on this week in legal blogging. Again, it's Colin, C-O-L-I-N at lexblog.com, Michelle, Michelle at lexblog.com. Uh, and you can hit us up and let us know on that front. But uh Unless other people have questions, uh, we'll leave it at that. And hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, the recording will be online. It is online right now. And again, you can't say it enough. We're here to help. So if you want us to you know, sit down with your group, do something like this for them, more than happy to do that. But uh, with that, uh, we'll close it down. And it's about uh, all there is to it. Thank you all so much for joining me today. I greatly, greatly appreciate it, Michelle. Nicely done as always. And uh, thank you all for joining us today and we'll uh, catch up soon.